Hello everyone, we're going to get into chapter 4 here, um, which is prenatal development and birth. Okay, and we're going to start at conception. So immediately following fertilization, so immediately after um, the sperm cell makes contact and embeds itself within the ovum, um, a chemical reaction happens that seals off the membrane that surrounds the ovum um, so that no other sperm can penetrate the egg cell. After that reaction takes place, the tail falls off of the sperm, the, the little propeller, um, and then all the genetic material that was contained within the head of the sperm enters the egg. And this is what we call a zygote. So this is the very, very, very first structure, um, the fertilized egg, the single cell egg, we call it a zygote. And here, immediately following conception, we're going to see um, epigenesis, which is the emergence of new structures and forms. So this is, you know, we're watching the single cell zygote divide and turn into what will eventually be a human child. Okay, so we're going to talk a little bit about um, characteristics of development that are pertinent to this, the prenatal development. And so when Development is characterized as cephalocaudal. What we mean is the head and areas near the head develop faster than any other area. Um, so any, any development that's taking place in the brain, near the head, near the head structure, that happens faster than near the feet or near the legs or near the rest of the body. And so this characterizes development from conception until about five months um, gestation. And it, it makes sense, right? So if you've ever seen um, a picture of an embryo or a fetus and, or any ultrasounds, you'll notice that, you know, their heads look really, really big compared to their bodies. And so this kind of happens um, at the very beginning of development. In contrast, proximal distal development is when areas um, near the trunk or near the abdomen, the center of the body, develop faster than those at the extremities. Um, and so this is, you know, the formation of major organs contained within the abdomen, um, lungs, digestive system, heart, like the, all those developments take place faster than formation of fingers or toes or fingernails or things like that. And so this characterizes um, development five months um, to birth. And so again, this makes sense. Like I mentioned, very early in development, um, embryos and fetuses, their heads look very, very big. And then the growth starts to even out and uh, the proximal distal development takes place. And then when the baby is born, their proportions are um, close to normal. Okay, we're going to go over some prenatal stages. So what I want you guys to focus on here is um, kind of when these stages happen and then what kind of growth is characteristic in these stages. So the very first stage, the germinal period, so this is from conception until about week two of gestation. Within the first week, that zygote turns into a blastocyst. So this is kind of a group of cells. So the zygote has started to divide already. And so it is called a blastocyst. This uh, period, the germinal period, carries the highest risk for miscarriage. And a lot of women don't even know that they're pregnant when a miscarriage happens within the germinal period. Often it's before um, they miss their menstrual period. It's often before any type of um, urine tests can detect, and so a lot of women, if they lose a pregnancy within the journal period, they don't even know. Um, a lot of it is, is due to genetic defects, so your body detects that um, this blastocyst is not going to be able to divide into a viable fetus, and so your body releases it and, um, and miscarries. Um, so again, journal period, very high risk for miscarriage, but a lot of women don't know that they've miscarried. In the embryonic period, so this lasts from about weeks three to eight, every major organ is formed um, during this time period. So the membranes um, kind of surrounding the zygote and the blastocyst um, are going to form into these organs. And so we have the amnion, and uh, that's the inner membrane, and then the chorion and the outer membrane form. The chorion eventually becomes the placenta, which um, is kind of the, the nourishment for the developing fetus. And parts of the amnion um, develop 
into different parts of the body. So we have the ectoderm, and that develops into your central nervous system, so your brain and spinal cord. The mesoderm develops into things like muscles and bones. Um, also your heart, kidneys, and gonads, which are either ovaries or testes, depending on the sex. And then the endoderm of the amnion um, develops into organs like your intestines and your lungs and your bladder. So kind of these smooth muscle uh, organs. Continue with the embryonic period. Um, the neural plate um, folds. And, and so we have kind of a plate full of, uh, of, of neurons and it, um, so it's, it's flat and then it kind of curves in on itself to form a tube. And so this is the beginning of um, the brainstem. And so it's, it's the start of the brain. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about what happens when this process goes wrong a little bit later in the lecture. Um, heartbeat is detectable after four weeks. And um, sexual differentiation and hormone secretion happens between about seven to eight weeks. Um, and so this is uh, in, in normatively developing fetuses um, when you can begin to detect the differences in biological sex. In the fetal period, um, so this is about weeks nine, about week nine to forty, or birth. Um, this is the critical period for brain development. So we have all of the major organs forming during the embryonic period, and then during the fetal period, we really see this brain development. Um, so we have proliferation. Um, so neurons are being generated; they're multiplying um, at, at a rapid pace. We also see migration, and so once those neurons are created in the center of the brain, um, they kind of move outwards towards other locations in the brain um, where they're needed. And then in differentiation, once those neurons arrive at those places where they're needed, they adapt and change um, to fill the function of wherever they are. So say you have a neuron that develops in the center of the brain and moves back towards the occipital lobe, it will adapt itself um, to the purpose um, of the occipital lobe, which is to gather and convey visual information. And so that neuron will adapt to what its function is meant to be based on where it lands. Neurons also develop the myelin sheath rapidly. Um, so this is a protective covering over neurons um, and also helps information transmit um, more quickly. And so myelin is very, very important for making and maintaining fast um, information transmission between neurons. Continuing with the fetal period, um, so we can see external sex organs appear, so either a vagina or a penis around the third month, and so this is typically when people will find out the sex of their child. Um, the age of viability, so babies are unfortunately can be born prematurely. What we have now um, discovered with the state of medicine uh, being how it is, is that 23 weeks is, is pretty much the youngest um, that babies can be born, the earliest babies can be born, 23 weeks gestation, to have a chance at survival. And again, the later that um, a child is born, closer to full term, the better chance they have. But we've determined that 23 weeks is it's kind of the cutoff um, for for how um, for the outcomes for premature babies. We also see pretty close to birth um, infant states um, would develop, and so these are patterns of activity. Um, some people can conceptualize them as sleep, um, but it's not true sleep because they're not truly awake. Um, so they do have kind of patterns where they're more active, when they're less active. We can see heart rate patterns. Um, we can see when they are more quiet in times of day. And so they do develop these patterns um, before, before they're even born. Okay, so we're going to talk about some epigenetic effects. And so we do know that the uterine environment or, or the prenatal environment and the conditions of the mother carrying the fetus during pregnancy can have epigenetic effects. Um, so these effects, again, may carry on to the offspring of the fetus. If you remember, 
in the last posted lecture, I was talking about those rat studies. And so, you know, the environment um, that those rats were in actually changed their genetic information and it was passed on to their offspring. And so the same thing can happen in humans and, you know, certain um, conditions can have certain effects that can carry on um, to the offspring of the offspring. So some examples, obesity, um, heart disease, mental health, particularly schizophrenia. Um, and I've mentioned before that schizophrenia is one of the most heritable um, mental disorders, and we have a lot of evidence to show its heritability. And so these are just some examples of that. The good news is that good environments can have good effects on a fetus, just like bad environments can have bad effects. Um, so if a mother is taking care of herself physically, um, taking care of her mental health, making sure that she gets all the nutrients that she needs, the extra vitamins, all that good stuff, that will have positive effects on the fetus. Okay, we're gonna talk a little bit about teratogens and health hazards to um, de prenatal development. So a teratogen is defined as any environmental agent that can cause harm to development. So any environmental substance. Um, these are substances that change um, the actual course of development um, of a fetus. So we know all the people who have been exposed to teratogens over a wide you know, breadth of research, these are just kind of averages, about 15% of babies born have minor issues and about 3% experience serious issues as a result of those teratogens. There are four things that I want you guys to remember when we're talking about teratogens, and this is true of a lot of things, but particularly these health hazards. There is a critical period for exposure. So if a developing fetus is exposed to a teratogen that affects a certain aspect of growth during that key time of growth, the effects are going to be worse. So if a fetus is exposed to um, a teratogen that affects brain development during, say, the fetal period, which is very important for brain development, those effects are going to be way worse than if it had been introduced earlier. Uh, dosage and duration, obviously, the greater the dose and the longer the exposure, the worse damage that we're going to experience from teratogens. Some teratogens don't require as big of a dose as others to have serious impact, but the general rule is the more and the longer, the worse. Genetic um, predisposition of both the mother and the fetus um, make them more or less susceptible. So that's just kind of a general rule. And then the quality of the environment um, can be protective or harmful. So if you're exposed to a teratogen, but you have an otherwise good um, prenatal environment, the effects might not be as devastating as if you were exposed to a teratogen and the prenatal environment was very poor. Okay, so one category of teratogens that we're going to look at is drugs. And so I'm going to talk about a drug called thalidomide. Thalidomide was prescribed in the 50s and 60s um, as a morning sickness reliever. And so obviously it was consumed by pregnant women. The effects of thalidomide were not fully understood when it was being prescribed um, to pregnant women to help relieve morning sickness. And it turns out that those women that were prescribed thalidomide, they actually had babies that were born with missing or malformed limbs. And so th what thalidomide does is, is it restricts blood flow to the limbs of a developing fetus. And so if this drug was given, especially in, in a, a consistent dose at the beginning of pregnancy, um, we see babies born without arms, without legs, sometimes without any limbs, sometimes limbs with only three fingers or, or two toes. And so it was a, it was a very serious um, impact on these children. Um, and I'll, I have a video that I'll post. Um, normally I would show it in class about kind of the impact of, of thalidomide. Um, and it's, it's actually being prescribed again um, for certain conditions and there's a controversy about it. Um, but all you guys need to know really is that it was a drug that was used by pregnant women, and um, it, it is a teratogen because it did affect the course of development and it caused limbs to not develop properly. Tobacco is also a commonly used um, drug, particularly cigarette smoking. 
Um, use has decreased in the U.S., though, uh, thankfully. Using tobacco while pregnant um, increases the risk for low birth weight, breathing issues, which kind of makes sense, um, cleft lips and palates. This is when the soft palate in the mouth or lips don't um, fuse together properly. They don't form properly. This can really impact um, a child's ability to feed, especially breastfeed. Um, central nervous system issues, um, risk of the child developing irritable bowel syndrome later in life, and then also a risk of a miscarriage if, if high enough um, dosage is used. And so tobacco also restricts blood flow. It's not as serious um, or immediately as impactful as thalidomide, though. Alcohol is another commonly used drug. And so alcohol crosses the placenta barrier. And so it's able to, when the mother consumes alcohol, it, it can actually affect the fetus directly. It disrupts neuron formation. And so in severe cases, um, these children have fetal alcohol syndrome which in addition to kind of this brain and spinal cord damage, um, behavioral issues, cognitive delays, um, physical and motor delays, um, they can be diagnosed with fetal alcohol syndrome, which includes all of those symptoms as well as some um, physical facial markers. And so children with fetal alcohol syndrome may have smaller wide set eyes, a flat and broad upper lip, broader noses, um, smaller ears. So those are the extreme cases. And so there are there's some conflicting advice about how much um, is safe to drink while pregnant. Some doctors will recommend a glass of red wine every now and then. Um, some doctors are more lax. The CDC actually though did publish um, kind of a finding or an announcement saying that there's no amount of alcohol to consume while pregnant that's totally safe. It really depends on the individual. And so they're just kind of issuing a blanket statement saying that drinking is not safe while pregnant. Cocaine is another drug that is considered a teratogen. Um, and so um, mothers who use cocaine while pregnant um, are at risk for miscarriage, um, fetal malnourishment, malnourishment and fetal strokes, which can um, be very, very damaging. Um, Children who, um, whose mothers reported using cocaine while pregnant tend to have problems behaviorally with attention, hyperactivity, that sort of thing. Okay, now before we talk about opioids, I just wanna say that while they are a health concern, especially um, with pregnant mothers, opioids are not a teratogen. They don't actually alter the course of a fetal development, um, but their danger we'll get to in a little bit. And so some commonly prescribed opioids, um, we have some examples here. Um, this also includes heroin. Um, if a mother consumes opioids or uses opioids, it can lead to addiction for the fetus when the fetus is born, when the baby's born. And so, they'll go through withdrawal symptoms. And so this is called neonatal abstinence syndrome. And if not monitored very closely, it can be dangerous. So newborns tend to have breathing problems and tremors, they're irritable. They may experience a fever and vomiting. They also tend to gain weight more slowly and not gain as much weight um, as, as other babies who were born to non-opioid using mothers. And so it's important to really watch um, the, this, this withdrawal or detox process. And so, like I said, opioids are not a teratogen because they don't alter the course of development, but they can still be dangerous. And so doctors recommend that women using opioids who find that they're pregnant follow a doctor's advice for a gradual withdrawal or detox um, instead of just quitting cold turkey because that can also be dangerous um, to the infant. Um, so getting back to teratogens. Um, some diseases can can serve as teratogens. So rubella, um, commonly referred to as measles, if experienced within the early stages of pregnancy, um, can cause blindness, deafness, intellectual delays, disabilities. Um, so unvaccinated mothers um, are particularly at risk for developing measles um, 
because most of us get the measles, mumps, rubella vaccine um, when we're younger. Diabetes, and what, what we're really talking about here is uncontrolled diabetes or poorly managed diabetes. Um, usually mothers who have diabetes that are well controlled and they become pregnant, they don't experience um, any of these um, teratogenic effects. However, with poorly controlled diabetes, we see a lot of premature babies, risk for stillbirth or miscarriage, um, heart problems, um, so neural tube defects, again, I was talking about how that plate kind of folds in on itself to form a tube and forms the base of your spinal cord. You're going to have problems with that formation. Also, some infants may gain too much weight in utero, be too large to deliver vaginally, and, and have to be delivered via C-section. We also see um, some sexually transmitted diseases or infections um, serve as teratogens. So um, HIV. And um, syphilis, if experienced in later stages of pregnancy, um, can actually cause the same um, type of symptoms as measles or rubella, um, but the difference between them is that syphilis is more dangerous at the later stages of pregnancy, and then rubella is more dangerous at the early stages of pregnancy. We also see some environmental hazards serving as teratogens. So one of the obvious ones is radiation, right? We all know radiation alters genetic material, it alters development. Um, the truth is that we all receive background radiation. Um, pretty much every soil type is radioactive on Earth. Um, you get kind of background radiation just for existing, really. What we're worried about is an overexposure to radiation. So we're concerned most about um, atomic weapons and nuclear disasters, which thankfully don't happen all that often. Um, but we also want to limit exposure, routine exposure to radiation. So um, repeated x-rays or Im imaging, um, any type of that type of radiation should be limited um, if a woman is pregnant. Pollution, uh, again, really the overexposure of pollution. So living in areas that are very industrialized but don't have a lot of clean air standards. And so we see developmental delays, including hand-eye coordination, psychomotor development. Um, lead exposure. So this is a really big public health issue, especially with um, the Flint water crisis. And so citizens of Flint that are consuming uh, or have consumed um, lead contaminated water. And if they were pregnant at the time, that can be that can have teratogenic effects. And um, so we see slower birth weights, smaller size and intellectual delays. Um, mercury exposure, so um, kind of a lower risk. We don't really see mercury thermometers being used that often, but what the concern here is really um, fish and seafood. And so there's a list of fish that are kind of high in mercury content um, that pregnant women are advised to avoid eating or to limit their consumption of just to make sure that, that mercury exposure stays as low as possible. And with that, we see kind of attention, memory, and language de deficits. Um, instead of just the broad intellectual delays of lead exposure. Um, pesticides and PCBs, reflex and learning dif difficulties, so we see those um, exposure to those as well, particularly in communities, farming communities where they use a lot of pesticides, and we can see those types of effects. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit about um, characteristics of the mother that might have an impact on development. Um, so age, the younger a mother is, um, the more risk there is for uh, babies to be born prematurely or miscarriages. Um, you know, especially teen mothers are more likely to be impoverished. Um, so, you know, even though um, puberty is happening earlier and earlier for young girls, their bodies aren't necessarily as well equipped or well developed to handle. Um, pregnancy and childbirth as someone who is in their mid-20s, you know, late 20s. However, older mothers may experience difficulties becoming pregnant. Um, they still do carry an increased risk for um, stillbirth or miscarriage. There's more of a risk of genetic defects, um, so the older um, the ovum or the egg cell, the more um, likelihood that it will divide incorrectly, um, produce some chromosome abnormalities that we talked about. There's also um, a greater chance of twins, um, particularly fraternal twins. Um, so it's more likely 
that um, two eggs will get released at once and then develop. Um, so that's an increased risk with older mothers. Um, race and ethnicity. Non-Hispanic black mothers we see are more at risk for, um, for difficult births and for prenatal complications. And a lot of this really is due to lack of access for quality health care. Um, I mean, a lot of these mothers don't have access or, you know, health insurance, um, don't have access to good prenatal care. They don't have a general practitioner or a primary provider. Um, and so these types of societal and systemic barriers put them more at risk. Um, the mother's emotional state can also affect development. So stress has a lot of damaging effects. Um, if you're, if you're, your kind of the panic center in your brain is always going if you're always stressed cortisol um, is kind of the stress hormone and so this can have effects on development and nutrition is one that we've re within recent decades kind of um, learned a lot about uh, regarding development so we do know that that being undernourished or malnourished stunts the growth of the fetus um, and it can lead to cognitive delays and particularly a lack of folic acid or folate can disrupt the formation of that neural tube, which is the beginning of the spinal cord. So again, a very critical kind of um, development that can be disrupted by um, lack of nutrition or by those teratogens that I mentioned. Okay, now we're going to talk about the perinatal environment, which is the environment surrounding the birth itself or the birthing process. So historically, um, kind of before hospitals, um, most women gave birth at home. And so they might have a doctor or a midwife or a nurse assist them, um, but most births took place in the home. And then as hospitals became more established and healthcare became more established, we kind of moved um, the birthing process to a hospital, to a specific floor of the hospital where there are doctors, nurses, medical staff, a lot, a lot of medical equipment in case anything goes wrong. We have seen in recent years a shift kind of back um, towards having the birthing experience be at home or in a birthing center instead of a hospital. Um, and, and where it used to be um, only doctors and nurses assisting, now we can have midwives because the profession's kind of revived, um, doulas, which are very similar to midwives. You can also have nursing staff, a doctor, if you wish. Um, and so the, the options of where to give birth and how to give birth, if that woman has the resources and access to health care, um, she can really choose where she wants to give birth and how she wants to give birth. That's not always the case, however, um, and especially for low income women with limited access to health care, it might not, not always um, have the same options. Okay, I'm gonna go a little bit through also the birthing process. Um, these pictures are in your book too, if you wanna take a look. Um, so stage one um, is pretty much like the tail end of labor. And so we have contractions and then the cervix opens um, to prepare for birth. In stage two, um, the head appears or crowns and then the baby passes through the birth canal. And then after that happens, um, the placenta is detached and then expelled through the same birth canal. Um, unfortunately, there, there are complications that can arise during birth that can be um, dangerous um, to the baby. Um, so anoxia uh, is, is a shortage of oxygen um, that occurs during birth. And so this can be from a wrapped umbilical cord, um, being kind of stuck in the birth canal for too long, um, just not getting access to oxygen during the birthing process. Um, and so some cases of anoxia don't have any lasting effects. We don't see any lasting effects with the baby. Um, sometimes they can have memory impairment and ranging all the way up, into, up to cerebral palsy. Um, so anoxia is really something that we want to make sure does not happen. And, and usually during the birthing process, babies are very closely monitored. Um, complicated delivery is also a possibility. So they really used to use forceps or suction to kind of um, pull a baby out that was stuck in a birth canal. Um, now it's less likely to be used 
they found that it does cause some skull deformities because, you know, newborns and infants' skulls are very soft. They haven't solidified yet to aid in the birthing process. Um, there's also um, the option of a cesarean section. So C-sections are a surgical procedure that cuts directly into the uterus to remove the baby without the baby traveling through the birth canal. Um, so sometimes this is done in an emergency. Other times it is done um, because the anatomy of the baby or the mother does not allow for a vaginal delivery. And so there is some controversy surrounding C-sections and how and why we give them. Um, but we do know that this technique has saved the lives of a lot of babies. And there's also a debate about what medications and what kind of painkillers to give um, during you know, the birthing process. Um, and so we'll continue to kind of research the safety and long-term effects of using these um, types of anesthetics. Um, postpartum depression is also um, not uncommon. Um, so about 15 to 20 percent of mothers experience it. It's defined as uh, two or more weeks of clinical depression or a clinical depressive episode um, after the birth of a child. And it doesn't have to be immediately after the birth, but kind of, you know, in that in that postnatal period. Um, and so this is concerning, um, not only from a standpoint of, you know, is is the mother getting her needs met and is her mental health OK, but also decline in mental health in the mother can also result in uh, the baby really not getting their needs met, can affect the bonding between mother and child. Um, a lot of hospitals and doctor's offices will screen for postpartum depression um, during the multiple kind of doctor's visits that you do with a newborn. And so it's being caught earlier um, and, you know, work is being done to increase access to resources and kind of erase the stigma around it. Okay, so we're going to talk about some at-risk um, environments. Um, so obviously different genetic factors can increase risk um, for an unhealthy neonatal environment. So after birth, um, anything that happened um, pre-birth, so in the prenatal environment, any teratogen exposure, anything like that, and perinatal damage, so anything that happened during the birthing process. So the, those factors um, can contribute to at-risk environments. It's kind of a first test um, to determine whether a baby is at risk. Um, they do what's called an APGAR test. And so newborns are screened for heart rate, breathing, um, reflexes, and uh, muscle tone. And so the scores range from one to 10. And usually a score of about eight or nine is a sign of a very healthy baby. Anything less than a six is kind of cause for concern. Um, and so those newborns are monitored very closely. Uh, but usually babies score between seven, eight, and nine. Um, low birth weight can can be a risk. So gaining weight um, slowly or not gaining a lot of weight, um, particularly um, if there are any feeding issues present that we that need to be detected and kind of um, corrected. Sometimes women don't produce enough breast milk and have to supplement with formula, um, but low birth weight can also be the result of some teratogens, including tobacco. Um, and so those those types of factors can put babies more at risk, obviously being born premature. And so a lot of treatments now um, in severe cases, neonatal intensive care units or NICUs are um, used. And so babies are kind of put under very close supervision with um, with nurses and staff everywhere. Um, other treatments include kangaroo care or, or what they call skin to skin. And so this usually typically involves um, putting the newborn on the chest of the parents and kind of that very close skin to skin contact. And it's been shown to improve outcomes, especially for premature babies and, and help with weight gain and also help with bonding um, between the parents and the child. So we do see outcomes improve generally over time. So um, a lot of babies that were born premature, by the time they're a couple of months old, they're pretty much on par with their peers that were born full term. Um, and it also improves with a good quality environment um, that exists after birth. So that's just really going to help um, any interventions or treatments um, work much better if there's a good postnatal environment.